to Ephesians 4. Let's read that. I mean, I've got it on your paper here, but it's a very important concept. Ephesians 4, about how we relate to one another. This whole Ephesians 4, first part of the passage is about how we relate. It starts out with unity, talks about gifts, and then goes into the fact that we're to speak truth with one another. I think speaking truth with one another is a lost art or a lost skill or a lost belief that it indicates when you can't speak truth within the body of Christ, then the body of Christ is not healthy. If you have to dance around and pretend that everything's okay when it's not, that's not healthy. And as part of the leadership here, I, I don't intend to do that. I don't plan on dancing around. Because you can speak the truth to people in love. It's what they need to hear. Hello. I've got beautiful women in this church, didn't you know that? Yeah. Wow. Uh, speaking the truth is how edification happens. That's what you come here for is to hear truth. Not to be patted on the back or just to be encouraged to be a better person, to hear that which is wrong that you might make it right. He says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Now you can speak the truth for the sake of speaking the truth, just because you like to be right, or just because you like to hear yourself talk. I've been accused of that myself. I do like to hear myself talk. Up here. Now when I get down there, I don't have much to say. But, rightly so. But, you, when you speak the truth because of love, because you care, because you're trying to help, People generally know that. They can sense that. They can feel that. And when you tell them that which they may not want to hear, but they need to hear, if they are humble and receptive, they will hear. This we often call conflict. It's actually something God has provided. It's a skill, if you want to call it. It's difficult to... Not sure how to term it at this point, but it's a skill of telling people what's right and what's not. And this we often call conflict, speaking the truth in love. One of our most common fears is that we will enter into a conflict with a loved one and that it will escalate, causing us to lose the relationship because we fear harming or even losing relationships, we simply avoid telling one another the truth altogether. For some reason, we've concluded falsely that it's better just to endure the hardship of somebody else's shortcomings and failures. And, and sometimes it is the case, but often we endure things that we shouldn't endure. And often we allow things to go on that we shouldn't allow to go on. Spirit will teach you about that and give you wisdom. But when, when, we, when we don't speak or enter into citing our differences because of fear, we're afraid. And you have to look at your motive. Why didn't I say something? I was afraid that they would reject me. I was afraid they wouldn't like me. I was afraid I would lose the relationship. I was afraid they wouldn't talk to me anymore. I was afraid that it would put us on a bad place. I was afraid. You just allowed your fear to keep you from edifying. See, it's not your job to be liked, even though we all want to be liked. It's your job to edify. 
edify. Gary goes and stands in front of a school, a whole room full of kids. Fear can't be part of that. Can't let fear. Well, if they throw you out, what if they throw you out? Well, how many would it take? Fewer than it used to would it take, but tell the truth. So, let's talk about conflict. Before we can develop new ideas and beliefs that help us live a more impactful Christian life, we must first remove beliefs that have u- we have used to avoid reality. Listen to the news. There's a whole branch of the country, there's a whole branch of the news media and a view and philosophy of life that is divorced from reality. There are people that are simply floating off into some kind of la-la land. I mean, it's insane where that which is not true becomes true because certain people drive a narrative that says it is true. And the rest of the country is now forced by political correctness to go along with that? Bull! Not doing that. Not doing that. That's nonsense. Time for the Christians to stand up and speak the truth in love. And I mean in the public square. Not in our huddled little church. In the public square. It's time for the truth to be told. And those that can't handle it, then deal with it. But that's when they're going to come because they have power. They're going to come and put you in jail. And they're going to come and take away your stuff. Maybe even your kids. So you're going to have to fight the fear and and ask the Lord, what is my job here? Now, we have wrong ideas. If you're here and you can't do conflict, and I know a lot of people that just can't do it, they will not conflict. They'll walk a million miles around something, an issue in their daily life to keep from bringing it up, to keep from talking about it, because they're afraid or because every time they do it brings anger it brings a confrontation that gets angry and loud and and that's hard that's difficult but sometimes that has to be let me tell you something whether you've understood this or not if somebody that you're talking to talks loudly and gets upset, you will not die. Now, this is generally the purview of men that haven't been able to get a grip on a situation that have a difficult time trying to accept the reality of it. And even if they're trying... They struggle with it. Doesn't mean they don't love you and doesn't mean that they hate your guts and they're about to hurt you or something. It doesn't mean that. It means that they're struggling within themselves to try to get a hold on what's going on. This is generally the purview of men that and forgiveness is the order of the day. It is the order of the day and there is no real relationship without forgiveness and in dealing with these issues. Quite often we just withdraw and we do that. It's hard when you're hurt and you're angry and you're and you're been dealing with conflict and you've not been able to resolve it. And you don't have listen, see let me tell you the truth. You don't have the courage to humble yourself and get help. You don't have the courage. You can say, well, I'm just too proud. I'm just too strong. I'm just too this. No. No, you don't want to be seen as weak. You don't want to have to deal with the fact that that you've not been able to make this work. And this is not just marriage, this is any relationship. I worked for a company years ago, 
uh, loved my boss. He quit, and they brought a new boss in that I absolutely despised. I mean, it takes a lot for me to work up the energy to despise someone. I mean, to even think or feel anything about people is a stretch for me. Not really. I love you guys. But, but for me to work up enough energy to despise this man was really a rare occurrence in my life. Uh, and I eventually got myself fired. Thank you, God. I was so glad. He said, "You can, I can fire you or you can quit. I said, well, how about before or after I kick your you-know-what? <laughs> and he said, well, that depends on whether you want to go to jail or not. I said, well, that's fair. That's fair. So I got my stuff and left. Uh, point being... It was time for some truth. And when truth is entered into with love, things get better. Understanding is reached. At least you understand where you are. Often we don't take things on and bring things up because we don't really want to know how bad it is. We think it's way worse than it is. All right. We have wrong ideas about conflict. We believe conflict is bad. It means something is wrong and must be avoided. We, we think conflict must be avoided at all cost. And if you're one of those that thinks that conflict must be avoided, then you've misunderstood its purpose. God has a purpose for it. We believe that if, con if relationship is good, that there will be few or no conflicts. Listen. If you think that a relationship that's good has no conflicts, then your idea of good is very weak. You have very weak ideas. You just want things to go along. Sometimes differences produce passion that makes life better and more enjoyable. Passion. Live with passion. We believe that conflicts indicate that the relationship is bad or in bad shape. Now, it can, and if it's ongoing and it's constant and you can't have a difference without fighting or debating, then maybe you, have, you need help. Listen, you don't need to quit. You don't need to give it up or get divorced. You need to get help. A counselor is a coach. He's a coach or she, a coach. You think, I don't need a coach. Why would I need a coach in my marriage or my relationships? Look, anybody who does something at a high level needs a coach. These guys getting ready for a debate on Monday night, they're being coached. Professional athletes get coaching, ongoing coaching. Professional golfers have coaches that stay with them all the way through. I mean, these are the best in the world. They get coaching. Is your marriage not at least that important than a stupid game played on TV? Get some coaching. Get some help. Go to somebody that's smart about this stuff that won't judge anybody who can see both sides of it and help you come together. Jeepers. You act like, you act like if you were to admit you had a problem that somebody would cut your leg off or something. We see conflict is something to avoid, to manage, to eliminate from all of our relating. We see conflict as something to fear because it's the beginning of the end. We see our differences as a reason why the relationship won't work or why it will end badly. And we're afraid that conflict will kill our love for one another because our wrong thinking about it causes us to choose mental sins. When it happens, anger, fear, turns into quarrels. It's just because, and listen, we won't get to it, but it's because of the stuff that we grew up with and what we saw and the patterns that we adopted for ourselves, and the hurt and pain in our soul and the fear that we won't ever get our needs met. 
that this person was supposed to meet our needs and they're, they're, it never has worked and now we know it never will, really because it would, never was supposed to work that way, it's supposed to be God. You tried to get it from him or her. But now let's talk about some right ideas. I hope, I hope that you understand that the idea of conflict is that it's something to avoid is something you've got to throw away. Throw that away. You're missing, you're missing half of life. You're missing the growth that could be happening in your life. This is how you grow through adversity and conflict. Now, conflict is a grace gift given by God, allowed, by the way, not given, not caused, but allowed to help partners achieve greater oneness. Conflict between marital partners is inevitable and should be expected with excitement. This is where you get, I said yesterday, what I call the impossible commands. The Bible has impossible commands. Be grateful for all things at all times. You read that and you, you know, for many years I read that and I just glossed over it. I just thought, that's ridiculous. It's hyperbole. Hyperbole means is a statement that's so exaggerated beyond reality that it's something that you, you aspire to maybe one day down the road somewhere over the rainbow. That's hyperbole. This be grateful for all things at all times cannot be a real command. Count it all joy when all the adversities in life fall upon you at once. Be joyful. That can't be real. You say to yourself, because that's humanly impossible. And of course it's humanly impossible, but it's spiritually, spiritually necessary to reach a place where you glorify God. If you don't get to that place where you can live that way, at least some of the time you're not glorifying God or in a very small way. Did you hear that? If you think the Christian life is just a normal human life with a few these and thous and a few prayers here and there, but you don't ever get to a place where you really do trust God in that way, that consistently, then you've missed what the Christian life is. That'd be a shame, wouldn't it? That'd be a shame to sit through all these Bible classes and miss the real meaning of the Christian life. I mean, if we're missing it, just think about these mega churches where nothing gets said. Where you have to substitute a lot of la 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 to have anything. No content. James Consider it all joy, fellow believers, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the proving of your faith, that means that as you use your faith in the Word of God to deal with this situation and it, and it enables you to be joyful, it proves out the validity of your faith. It proves out the power of God's Word for everybody to see. So that your faith in that produces endurance. In relationships, endurance is the belief that things will be okay. Things will work out. Many people, after a point, they give up. They give up hope. Listen to me. They disobey God. They reject the confidence that God's word commands and provides, and they give up. They give up. And they retreat and call a truce and they live over here by themselves simply going through the motions of being married or going to church or going to ministry or whatever it is they do, just going through the motions. It's not real and that's not the Christian life. This word consider is hegeomai. 
So geoma literally means to guide your mind, to guide your imagination, to create in, to, listen, listen to me, to purposely create scenarios in your mind that of, of God producing good out of this. Car crash and what comes of it. The worst ever. The worst ever. And yet from God's perspective, he says, that's not true. That's not true. What I plan and allow and and set up in your life is not the worst ever. It's the best ever. It's the right thing. It's what needed to happen so that the world can come back where it needs to be. So you're going to fight me? No. You're going to get on his side and rejoice with him. Now, you guide your mind to see the good. You say, I don't see any good coming out of this conflict in my life. I don't see any good coming out of it. Well, you don't have God's imagination. And that means you're, you've quit and given up and you've decided to be angry and bitter and feel sorry for yourself and sit around and suck your thumb. Is that love? Is it okay if I say that? Hope so. I already said it. Listen, you don't think I've lived like that in my marriage for years? Trying to figure out how to make this work. Why we couldn't seem to get things going on together and why we had to fight all the time and argue and how it was always my fault. That was the part I couldn't figure out. I knew it was true. Anyway, it's only when you are willing to stop hiding all this and pretending making a show of it for everybody else, that you're able to humble yourself and get help and begin to open this up and see and realize I didn't understand at all what she was thinking. Had no idea. I thought it was this angry, hard stuff, and in reality, it, it was hurt and, and questions and struggles within that were all honorable and right had I understood it and seen it as it really was, I would have done more comforting instead of reacting. You don't understand what's going through the other person's mind or what they're struggling with or what their past has caused them to, the habits they formed in their mind that, if, that are hurting them, and so you're not willing to talk about it. You're just going to react and be angry. I deserve better than this. I deserve better than this. This is not what I had in mind. You deserve better. Mm, that's interesting. You mean like going to hell? You mean like really paying for your sins instead of Christ? You deserve that? Yeah, that's what you deserve. The fact that God has given you a husband or a wife that will stay with you is a gift itself. Stop saying I deserve this. The truth of the matter is with this conflict is that the path God has laid out for you in your mate's soul and the conflicts that come along are perfectly designed for you to grow and become the person He intended you to be so that you can glorify Him the way He intended and receive the blessings and reward that He wants for you. This thing's perfect. You say, well, we're the ones that screwed it up. Do you don't think he knew that? He don't think you knew he knew you were going to screw it up the way you did? And that the answers that you need to fix it are the very things that you need to grow? You don't, he doesn't know all that? Oh, I know. Your problems are way bigger than him. Stop being afraid of this. Stop ignoring it. Stop backing away from it. Stop pretending that it's okay when it's not. Stop trying to hide it. Come out with it and let's, let's get some things fixed. Life's too short. Conflict is inevitable. 
You take two different people, male and female. You heard that, right? Male and female. We're talking marriage here. Sometimes I'm talking marriage and sometimes I'm not. But here, marriage is male and female. With two different family backgrounds, two different parental marriages that they come from, financial goals, expectations, sin nature patterns, and you put them in one home, try to work together as one team, there's going to be a zillion conflicts. There's going to be a zillion differences. The way you handle them means everything. Structural differences lived out honestly necessitates conflict. Marriage without conflict is not healthy. If you're in a marriage without conflict, geez, you're not alive. Are you alive? We need to take a pulse. Now, as you get older and you've been together a long time, a lot of stuff just kind of gets easy. So if you're not conflicting because you worked it all out, that's a good thing in a sense, but it means it can mean that you've stopped growing. It can mean that you've sort of just accepted it and you're just sitting there waiting to die. Where's your ministry? Listen, we, we, we have so missed it. I mean, and I'm talking about us with this, these great doctrinal Christians, whatever that means. We have so missed it. We just are still people going through the motions of coming to church and going home and living a normal Christian life. I mean, a normal human life with Christian on the side. Our lives not given over to Christ. It's not. Our lives not given over to Christ. You're telling me your life's given over to Christ? That every, that you, when you wake up in the morning, you think, what can I do and give to God today to make his kingdom come? No. We wake up every day and we look at all the human goals and accomplishments we need to get done today and we hope God helps us get those done. Right? That's what we do. We're all about getting our human life the way we want it. Not about letting that go and, and getting God's spiritual kingdom the way he wants it. Doesn't even cross our mind. Your marriage is a ministry. It's purpose, and we talked that yesterday at the conference, if you had been there and could have gone, that there's a human purpose to meet our needs, and then there's a spiritual purpose, which is to create an image of Christ in the church. And that when a wife submits to her husband, she's not submitting to the human being man for his human pleasure and his human convenience, which is how we think about it. Women think about submission as somehow this guy's kicked up, you know, give me another beer. That's what women think. They feel offended that, oh, get me another beer, honey, while you, what was that song? Willie Nelson put another log on the fire, cook me up some bacon and some beans you know, clean up the house and mow the yard and paint the gutters and all this kind of stuff and then go and get me another beer and come and tell me why you're leaving me. Uh, that's the idea. Listen, submission is nothing to do with that. Submission is to the Lord to create an image of Christ in the church. So if a woman ever does that, if she ever enters into that ministry, it has nothing to do with the human being man that she's married to. It has to do with her surrendering her life to the Lord for His purposes. But women are not going to do that because it's been sold as something to benefit a human being man. It has nothing to do with that. Somehow he's better. He should be in the head. He's the head of the woman like Christ is head of the church as an image for fallen angels and the world to see, to understand the relationship God wants with his creation. Has nothing to do. Listen, stop making everything about you. 
I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm way too important for that. See, you need to hear this. You need to be conflicted. You need to be confronted. You need to be braced and told your thinking is wrong. You can't grow unless you hear these things. Conflict's inevitable. Conflict reveals our selfishness, our false thinking, and our sin patterns. When there's a conflict in your life that is cre- that turn- uh, and when there's a difference between you and another that turns into a quarrel, more than a discussion, you're at odds. The first thing you should look for is, a, am I being selfish? Am I being selfish? If you see that you are, which many, many percentages up the ladder you are, then you need to give that to the Lord. It enables you to see yourself so that you can work on yourself. Marriage, listen, marriage is the great mechanism for that God has given us to see ourselves. If you can't see yourself through marriage, you, you're you're blind as a bat. It enables you to see that which needs to be removed and that which needs to be replaced. Conflict reveals our differences so that we can get a bearing on each other's position and thinking. <clears throat> Rhonda and I, 10 years in, went to counseling. I mean, not that we needed it. Huh? I had no idea what she was thinking. I had imagined all this other stuff that she was thinking and the reasons why she kept acting the way she did. I had a whole different scenario in my mind. And this lady was able to pull all this out and go, and I was like, wow, I had no idea. I thought it was this. It had nothing to do with what I thought. I was just so I was so far off target. It was the beginning for me, at least, of coming to a place of great joy and enjoyment of this lady in my life and becoming a team. Listen, not just a team that works well for her and I, but where we can begin to be a ministry for God. That's what you want. And I'm not just talking, listen, this could be in any relationship in your life. It doesn't have to just be your marriage, but if you are married, it should be that. See, the goal of marriage, Christian marriage, is not to just get to a place where everything's easy and you got it laid out, you know, and you're... No, the goal of Christian marriage is to become a fighting team, an elite force with a mission to create an image of Christ in the church. You're a fighting elite team. This is a war we're in. Conflict provides the opportunity to examine your priorities in relationships. Who's the most important person in your life? You, your mate, or God? In our immaturity and selfishness, it's me. I got married for me. This marriage should be serving me and my needs and what I want. And if it's not, then something's got to change. And that something's going to be you. Sound familiar? And then the world, but the world comes along and says, no, 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 that's the wrong priority. The wrong priority should be your mate. Put your mate first. And you think, boy, that sounds right. That sounds good. And then God comes along and says, hey, uh, what am I, Swiss cheese? What about me? How about putting me first? When we're able to do that, and the only way to ever get to that place, and look, early on we talked all, listen, we said all of these words 
early on that we're going to be a great ministry for God and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and blah, 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 blah. It was just words. There were the right words and the right aspiration, but we had no capacity to do any of it for real. It's only through spiritual growth, the laying aside of your humanity, uh, goals and aspirations and, and your worldliness, and letting that go and replacing it with new man thinking that you're able to have the capacity to really, really be that person. One reason that I quit at these conferences, I don't know, I've done about 15 of them or more myself, been part of them, and I've been a teacher at all of them. I quit, I quit trying to give just specific marital advice to people that were conflicting because I realized if I fix up your human life, if you let me get in there and piddle with your human life, I can make all that work, work better. There's techniques and methods to make all that work better, but where's God in all that? How have I served His need? How have I served God in that? And I haven't. So now my marital influence with, with believers is to talk about where's God in this thing? Not just to help. Now, am I able to help you fix your human marriage? Of course. Would I be glad to do that? Of course. But don't think that that's what I'm about or that that's what the goal is. So, conflict provides us an opportunity to see our relations, relational priorities. Conflict gives us the opportunity to believe the truth. To use the truth to edify your mate and use the truth to, edif to, to glorify God. Conflict. Now, let me give you a little summary here. Have you ever thought about conflict this way? I mean, we think about conflict as something bad, something to avoid, when in reality, it, it's a wonderful gift. It's how you get stuff clarified. I mean, if you don't, if your mate never speaks up, I mean, you wonder... some things I shouldn't say, but uh, you wonder how long they've been hating that. You know, you wonder how long you've had bad breath and they've not told you. Why wouldn't you tell them? All right. It is not will we conflict. That is a given. And listen, if you're thinking of marriage... It is good to be com have compatibility. Compatibility in marriage makes everything much easier, even enjoyable. Good luck with that. If you are incompatible in areas, just your marriage counseling, just premarital counseling, if you're very incompatible, like you say hello and she's ready to fight you, then maybe you ought to find somebody else. But... If the compatibility is there and there's areas of incompatibility, then you work on those. One of the things that conflict does is it helps you find the middle ground. It becomes an occasion where you go, hmm, I wonder where the middle is. I wonder where the middle is so that both of us can be, have our needs met. Both of us can be satisfied with this. It doesn't have to be all one way or the other. See, when you're afraid to conflict... You just let the other person have their way and they don't even know any different. And then you got one person who's selfish and wants all their way and the other person who's fearful and just lets them have it. See, we end up with a lot of women, Christian marriages, because women are really good at running things. Christian marriages where the women run the show and the men just kind of go along with it. And you ask them why, you pull them over and you ask them why, and they said, well, it's just easier that way. 
mean, I just got tired of fighting. You know, I got tired of fighting for it. And uh, that's why Paul comes along and says, women, this is your job. Your job is to submit. Don't think that it's his job to make you submit or persuade you to commit or to love you into committing or to be such a he-man that you can't help but commit, I mean submit. All that's BS. It's your job to surrender yourself to the Lord. Your job. It's addressed to the woman. So if you say, I ain't doing that, then you're, what you're telling the Lord is, I'm not going to obey you. It has nothing to do with this human man. I know I'm repeating myself, but it's important. The woman has to do that herself. And it's about God, and it's not about this man. The man has to love her. It's his job to think nurturing, nurturing, nurturing. In Ephesians 5, listen, Husbands, love your wife. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Now, that sounds like spiritual stuff to me. How about you? The husband's job is to treat his wife in such a way that he assists her and helps her, aids her, provides an environment for her to grow spiritually. He stops looking to her for anything to serve his needs, anything to serve his needs, anything to serve his needs, and becomes the nurturing party in the relationship. The nurturing, the nurturing. He's growing her up. He's, he's, he's providing nurture for her to grow spiritually. In that whole business is going to be a lot of differences and conflict. Use it. To clarify, use it to help each other, use it to come to understanding. Instead of defending yourself and fighting to save face, think about understanding. How we act toward each other when we conflict will determine whether we use it to edify one another or use it to hurt one another. Mature believers with a relationship with the Spirit, are able to walk in love even in the midst of conflict. See, they can walk in love minus selfishness, mental attitude sins. If you can avoid mental attitude sins in this, you can keep your wits about you. Disagreeing, arguing, and debating respectfully for the purpose of improving the marriage is felt and is a source of edification rather than pain and when we fail to conflict honorably and we enter into mental sins we must forgive listen if you're in if you're in unresolved conflict in your relationship of some kind the only way to get this thing started is forgiveness you must forgive you must go inside of your soul and talk to God you must see yourself standing before God bringing up this issue, this is what he did, this is what she did, and you must give that to God and you must see him put that on the cross and pay for it and wipe it away. It's gone. And as soon as you do that, you see if you feel it, it comes right back. It comes right back and you feel the same way, so you do it again. And you do it again. And you do it again. And after a while, it stops coming back. It only comes back every now and then. And when it does, you give it to him and he puts it on the cross and it's erased. And you keep going and you keep going until it stops coming back 
and you don't feel that way anymore, and you don't hold that against the person anymore, and that's called forgiveness. Just simply acknowledging that Christ paid for it, that's not forgiveness. Coming to the place where you don't feel this anger and hurt against the person anymore is forgiveness, is functional forgiveness, is what is necessary to be able to resume relationship. And sometimes you have to do that a hundred times a day. And if you've stopped doing that, then you are in a state of disobedience. You are in reversionism. Period. You're in a state of reversionism and you are not obeying God. And you are throwing away the greatest opportunity in your life to glorify Him. Throwing it away because it got hard. Throwing it away because it hurt. And that is ridiculous. And you've got to get up from that because God has built into you much more than that. Now you people know how I feel. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to hear these things and to be confronted by our, our pettiness, our immaturity, our selfishness, our self-pity. And I pray, Father, that you would, would confront us in our hearts about these things that we might make the changes necessary to come out of this and come to a place of great joy and honor for Christ. Take this offering, bless it, multiply it, meet many needs with it. Pray again, Father, for our brothers and sisters that are off, that you'd bring them home safe to us. Edify them in a great way. We love you, Father, in Christ's name. <laughs>